Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, welcome. And, and I would like you to give the international recognition of appreciation for a man who braved all this traffic and fought his way through the security to make it here to be with you tonight, Ambassador Jalilo. My name is Tony Kelly Foster. I have the uh, privilege of being the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council, D.C. The man who comes to our podium tonight is a friend, a personal friend, friend of the United States, and a very superb spokesperson for his country, not only here in the U.S., but globally. The United States has had diplomatic relations with Pakistan since its independence in 1947. Approximately 500,000 members of the Pakistani diaspora reside in the United States. The U.S. is Pakistan's largest bilateral trading partner, with 15% of their textiles, rice, other goods being exported to the United States. In addition to the important economic relationship between the United States and Pakistan, there is a critical allied defense and anti-terrorism relationship as well as humanitarian, cultural, and educational program priorities in place. In October 2009, the U.S. Congress passed the Enhanced Partnership with Pakistan Act that demonstrates and reaffirms the U.S.'s long commitment to cooperation with the Pakistani people and their civilian institutions. In May 2014, Following Prime Minister Sharif's visit to Washington, the U.S. and Pakistan established a joint action plan to expand bilateral trade and investment over five years. In January 2015, the U.S. pledged $250 million to help Pakistan facilitate the relief, reconstruction, and return of federally administered tribal area communities displaced by counterterrorism operations. They did so because Pakistan is a partner in the global war on terror. Pakistan has had a cooperative and long-standing relationship with the United States on counterterrorism efforts, particularly since 9-11. Pakistan has provided the US with access to a number of military airports and bases along with other logistical support for the war on terror. Pakistan has also captured more than 600 members of al-Qaeda, the Taliban, ISIS, and has, has been an increasingly important member of the global community of nations fighting with the allies on the war on terrorism. Just a little overview of the population of Pakistan and its ethnic groups. 45% Punjabi, 15% Pashtun, 14% Sindhi, 8% Sarika, and 8% Mujars. 38% of its population lives in urban areas. Education is a critical national priority as the literacy rate in Pakistan is currently 58%. Pakistan is a nuclear power and has a strong military, within which women play an equal and prominent role. His Excellency Jalil Abbas Jalani is a career diplomat who has also served as ambassador of Pakistan to Belgium, Luxembourg, and the European Union, as well as being Pakistan's High Commissioner 
to Canberra, Australia. Ambassador Jelani supports President Obama's policy of avoiding the, the use of words like Islamic and Muslim to describe violent extremism and terrorism movements. And I will say this personally, I agree with them both on that point. He said around the world, only a small number of Muslims engage in such activities. So it is unfair and counterproductive to paint the entire community with the broad brush of extremism. This is not an activity that is exclusive to any religion or group. He is also honest in acknowledging that many countries, including Pakistan, need to do more to be part of countering the regional and global impact of radical extremists. He is happily married to Shaista Jelani, and they have three lovely sons. One works for the United Nations in Rome, and the other two are studying at prestigious universities in the US, and I know their grades are high because their parents inspect their report cards on a regular basis. We are honored to welcome Ambassador Jelani to the podium of the World Affairs Council, Washington, DC, as a friend of the United States of America, a respected diplomat in the global community. He is here as part of our ambassador series. We are also honored to welcome another distinguished Pakistani, Dr. Mahida Alfaz, our discussant for this evening. Among numerous accolades, Dr. Alfaz is a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institute, where she re researches the intersection of development, security, and political economy in Pakistan. I will tell Ambassador Jelani and Dr. Alfaz that you have tonight a great opportunity, an opportunity to share your knowledge and your perspectives with an educated, informed audience that we're pleased to see includes a number of students who are at universities from across the United States. We're also delighted that C-SPAN is covering this event tonight, and we thank Brian Lamb for his public service in making this remarkable television resource available to the United States and the world. So let us give a warm welcome to Ambassador Jelani and ask him if he will be kind enough to address us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Tony, for a wonderful uh, uh, welcome and providing this uh, uh, prestigious forum uh, to me to uh, share my perspective on some of the important issues besides uh, Pakistan-U.S. relations. I would like to briefly touch upon the uh, regional security challenges and also the kind of uh, uh, um, active initiatives that the government of Pakistan has taken to promote education in the countries, in the country, and you know also reforms of the madrasa system. Uh, Pakistan-U.S. relations certainly it is one of the most important relationship for my country. Without doubt, it's a unique relationship which has seen many ups and downs. And since 1947, we have been an ally of the, uh, of the U.S. We have been part of every initiative that the United States of America had taken, not only in our own region, but also globally. I have, when we talk about the uh, ups and uh, downs in this relationship, I have absolutely no doubt that the current phase is certainly one of... Uh, partnership and building convergences. In the past several years, we have had our respective shares of complaints against each other. But, the, uh, but certainly, we have 
recognized, we have realized that we need to transcend the past and look to the future. And with, and with this objective in mind, we, are, we have opened a new chapter in our relationship between Pakistan and the United States of America. In our view, some of the important developments which are taking place internally in Pakistan and also the kind of regional and global challenges, I would call them, term them the common global challenges that we are faced with that would fundamentally alter the course of this relationship, making it more robust, sustained, and strategic. Internally, Pakistan over the last several years has gone through a silent revolution. And Tony has very ably captured the current mood in Pakistan. We certainly are a transformed country. And I say there are some very strong reasons for, for saying that. First, democracy, though noisy, it's getting stronger by the day. It is taking strong roots. Our media is ruthlessly independent. Courts are, judiciary is independent, and we have a vibrant, active civil society. There is a lot of focus on economic revi revival, good governance, an end to extremism and terrorism, focus on health, education, energy sector development, human rights, and empowerment of women in the country. There is also a national consensus against extremists and terrorists. And because of this national consensus that we have developed, we have been able to break the back of extremist and terrorist organizations in the last one year. Peshawar school tragedy in which 150 innocent children, they were killed by, by uh, the, uh, these uh, evil forces. We have been able to, to develop a national consensus and we took decisive actions against these forces. And today when I speak to you, while terrorism and extremism is on the increase in some of the other countries, in Pakistan it is, on the, it is declining. And we have absolutely no doubt that in the next coming months, we will be able to completely eliminate this phenomena from our, our subsoil. Ladies and gentlemen, in this back backdrop, I feel that Pakistan is certainly better positioned to meet multiple challenges. We have no doubt that a strong US-Pakistan partnership will only strengthen our ability to contribute to security and stability in the region. We consider the US as a vital partner. Today, we have more convergences than divergences. I remember that last year, Secretary Kerry rightly pointed out that the big objectives United, uniting Pakistan and the United States of America are bigger than those which divide us. And I think that, again, is a very apt statement that has come from Secretary Kerry. From Pakistan's perspective, the strategic partnership must be based on mutual interests and mutual respects. Understanding of our respective security concerns, a realistic expectations from each other, and also a positive narrative about each other. There is also a need to identify areas of common interest at the bilateral, regional, and global plane. Bilaterally, ladies and gentlemen, since the revival of the strategic dialogue process two years ago, we have come a long way. We have established six working groups. 
working group on economic and trade cooperation, working group on energy sector cooperation, a working group on education, counterterrorism and law enforcement working group, defense cooperation and nuclear non-proliferation and strategic stability. And the scorecard is certainly very, very impressive. We are making very good progress in all these working groups. We have agreed to a plan of action to promote economic and trade cooperation. Our cooperation on counterterrorism and law enforcement has resulted in the, in the uh, 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 enhanced capacity of our security forces besides reduced threats from IEDs and extremists and terrorist organizations. In the uh, energy sector, again, we have a wonderful cooperation going on. In the last one year, because of the assistance provided by the United States of America, we have been able to add about 1,400 megawatts of, national, of, uh, of energy in our national grid. Besides the, the uh, assistance that we are getting, we are getting the fullest support from the United States of America on some of the mega energy projects that we have initiated in the country. And mind you, that these developments have also enhanced the American ranking in the eyes of the Pakistani public because the focus on education, the uh, assistance we are getting on economic development is all these are areas which are seen very, very positively by the people of Pakistan. Education certainly has been a very important um, sector of our cooperation. Uh, education was also one of the key agenda items when our Prime Minister recently came to, the, to Washington DC on the invitation of President Obama and the joint statement that was issued at the uh, end of that meeting that also referred to uh, education cooperation as one of the most important areas of cooperation between our two countries. Defense cooperation similarly is also very strong. So is the intelligence cooperation. And this is an, again an, a very important area of cooperation because the kind of challenges that we are faced with or the, uh, um, not only the regionally but also related to Daesh and other such uh, um, elements who are emerging on the scene that would require closer cooperation between Pakistan and the United States of America. Again, um, on the nuclear issue, we all, again, we have developed broad, broad convergences on most of the issues. At the regional level, again, at the, uh, we have shared interest in peace and stability in South Asia. Peace in our neighborhood certainly would enhance our domestic security beside, besides economic development. Pakistan is located at the crossroads of three important regions, South Asia, Central Asia, and the Middle East. And we can act as a bridge between, uh, uh, for prosperity and development in this region. We are also pursuing several it, uh, regional interconnectivity projects in, the, in our region, including uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, work on which has already started. It's an Im ambitious um, economic corridor project which, uh, with, a, with a total investment of about $46 billion. Besides that, we are also developing uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India gas pipeline and CASA 1000, which is a electricity uh, connectivity project uh, from Central Asian republics passing through Afghanistan to Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, at the global level, again, we have an excellent cooperation on some of the most important issues, including climate change, terrorism, and nuclear non-proliferation. Here, I would like to say that you may recall that in the uh, early 70s, Pakistan played a pivotal role 
in building bridges between US and China, and we brought about a rapprochement between those, these two important uh, power centers. And we did this on the belief that a positive relationship between China and the United States of America would contribute to peace and stability and would also bring about peace and stability in the region. We would like to continue that role, uh, not only in our region, but also in, in the Middle East, because we enjoy a very close relationship with the Middle Eastern countries. And, uh, and we certainly can, and uh, uh, being a good friend of not only the United States of America, but also other neighboring countries, including Iran, we can play that kind of a role. Talking about the regional security challenges, I would uh, confine myself to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to basically two of our neighbors. One is India, and the other is Afghanistan. India, Pakistan relations, unfortunately, the history has not been a glorious one. We have had wars, we have uh, tensions, and we have also a, made uh, continued attempts to undermine each other. And this has been the story of Pakistan-India relations since 1947. But at the same time, there is also a realization that war is certainly not an option between two nuclear neighbors. Because all the previous wars that we fought, were well, we fought them with literally bows and arrows. There is a realization amongst the people of the two countries and in Pakistan that economic development cannot take place in the region. Economic development cannot take place in Pakistan and India without a peaceful environment. And I think this is, and, and, and there is also a realization that, that uh, the forces of extremism and terrorism, they also thrive in, a, in an environment of tension and hostility. Because the, the, uh, such elements, they always exploit the rivalries of the two countries, and uh, they further exacerbate the situation between uh, our two countries. It is with this realization that I am very happy to inform that in Pakistan, almost all political parties if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the elections which have taken place in Pakistan, two or three successive elections in the last three or four, um, um, uh, about two, two decades or so, the political parties in their manifesto have very clearly articulated uh, peace uh, with, the, with India, peace with Afghanistan, and peace within the region. So that is the election slogan which is being made by almost all the political parties. Our prime minister, his party, he also won the election on, on a slogan, peace through economic development, or economic development through peace. That was the slogan that was made by the prime minister and his party. And majority of the people in Pakistan, they voted uh, for, this, for, for creating a peaceful environment in, in the region. Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Nawaz Sharif, he was the first leaders in South Asia to congratulate Prime Minister Modi when he was, he was elected as the Prime Minister of India. He also participated in the, in the swearing-in ceremony of Prime Minister Modi. He undertook a travel visit to India to participate there. But unfortunately, I would term the last two years as wasted years. Wasted years because we could not resume the dialogue process despite many understandings or agreements that were reached between the leadership of the two countries. Uh, we were disappointed, but we did not relent in our efforts, and we continued to make efforts to, to engage India. I am, we are encouraged that after last week's meeting between Prime Minister 
of Pakistan and Prime Minister Modi on the sidelines of the uh, of the environment of, of the climate summit in Paris, the two leaders agreed to uh, agreed that the national security advisors and the foreign secretaries of the two countries they should meet. They met in Bangkok, and now today, when I am talking to you, the Indian Foreign Minister, uh, Madam Sushma Swaraj, is visiting Pakistan, and for the uh, for the uh, Heart of Asia conference, ministerial meeting, which is basically meant uh, uh, to uh, show solidarity with Afghanistan and also to contribute to economic and security development of Afghanistan, which is being hosted in Pakistan. We feel that these interactions will certainly um, um, uh, reduce tension between our two countries. Our only hope is that these interactions, the initial interactions which are taking place, they, uh, they result in the revival of a serious, sustained, uninterrupted and uninterruptible dialogue process between our two countries. Afghanistan, ladies and gentlemen, is, uh, uh, is uh, again a very important country. We share almost 2,700 kilometers long border with Afghanistan, which is a porous border. Porous in the sense that you would be surprised to learn that every day, 60 to 70,000 Afghans, they undertake visits to Pakistan to earn their livelihood. They come in the morning, either they go back at night or the next day, or sometime they stay in Pakistan to, for, um, to earn their uh, livelihood and go back after days. Many of them, they also stay back. We are hosting three million Afghan refugees in Pakistan for the last almost 35 years. We have also made every effort to contribute to peace and stability in Afghanistan. Because we are doing this because no other country besides Afghanistan has suffered as much as Pakistan has due to the uh, three decades, more than three decades of turmoil in that country. And an early settlement of peace and tranquility in Afghanistan is something that would be extremely beneficial for, for our country. We uh, had carried out military operations on the, in the border areas in, the, in North Waziristan, which had uh, become a safe haven for many of the dreaded terrorist organizations. The operations were initiated in June last year. And again, it's a matter of great pride for me to announce that we have been able to clear the whole of uh, North Waziristan of these elements of, of every shade and color. Peace has returned to Afghanistan. It was a gigantic operation in the sense that it's a, it's a case study in the sense that we developed a national consensus before we went in. We evacuated a million uh, uh, civilians, the, tri uh, the tribal civ uh, civilians from from Waziristan, brought them to safer locations, carried out operations. And then now we are trying to rehabilitate habilitate those one million people back in their homes. We did this not only to bring peace and stability in our own country, but also it was meant to bring about peace and stability in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, some of these elements, they have crossed over to Afghanistan and now carrying out attacks, not only in Afghanistan, but also in Pakistan. We feel that there are two paths to peace in Afghanistan. One is a military victory over the insurgents, and the second is the negotiated peace through a process of national reconciliation. Over the last 14 years, a military solution has 
remained elusive. We have shed a lot of blood, blood and treasure in order to bring about that peace and stability, but that has not come about. It is unlikely that we will be able to achieve that peace through military means in the future also. So accordingly, what we have suggested is that this, we should try and bring about peace through negotiations in Afghanistan or through a process of national reconciliation. We have, in our interaction with the Afghan leadership, we have suggested to them that Pakistan would be willing to play a role for not only the revival of the, of the interrupted reconciliation process between Afghan Taliban, but also uh, Afghan Taliban with the uh, Afghan government, but we will be able to, uh, to uh, uh, bring about other, uh, take, we will be able to take other steps in order to peace, bring peace in Afghanistan. We have, uh, we have undertaken a lot of uh, projects in Afghanistan, the uh, infrastructure development projects. We have built hospitals in Afghanistan. We have um, 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 uh, built schools in, Af in Afghanistan. We have built the road network in, in Afghanistan. And also we are trying to help Afghanistan economically. Every year we offer 6,000 scholarships to, uh, to Afghan students to come and undertake studies in, in, in various educational institutions in Pakistan. And these 6,000 scholarships that we offer, they're in addition, to the, uh, in addition to the education facilities which are being provided to the children of the refugees who are residing in Pakistan. Tomorrow, President Ashraf Ghani would be visiting Pakistan because of the, because the because, uh, because of the Heart of uh, Asia conference, which is being organized in Pakistan. Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Nawaz Sharif, and President Ashraf Ghani, would, they would jointly um, inaugurate and address the Heart of Asia meeting. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, education is certainly one of the pr primary area of, uh, of uh, focus by the current government. Our Vision 2025 document that was approved by the cabinet last year aims at substantial expansion of enrollment of all children as well as improvement in the quality of education. The government is committed to increase the budgetary allocation from the current 2% of the uh, GDP to 4% of the, of the GDP by 2018. Similarly, we have also uh, increased public expenditure on higher education from the current 0.2% of GDP to 1.4% of the GDP. Recently, uh, in 2012, the government passed the Right to Free and Compulsory Education Act 2012, making all five to 16-year-old children eligible for free and compulsory education. Under the Prime Minister's education, uh, education initiative la uh, launched recently, a comprehensive plan of action has been, has been initiated for upgrading in school infrastructure, uh, uh, human resource de development, teachers training, curriculum improvement, and madrasa reforms. Similarly, the provincial governments have also initiated projects aimed at achieving universal primary education as uh, well as improvement in the ad adult lit literacy, especially for women. Malala Yousafzai, as you know, has become a role model for all young girls in Pakistan, and we are witnessing increased enrollment by, by young girls, even from the remote areas of of Pakistan, including in the tribal areas, who are coming forward to, 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 to get education. Um, I was surprised to learn recently when I went to Pakistan that uh, in the medical institutions in Pakistan, the, the girl students, they outnumber the boys. So this is a recent phenomenon that we are witnessing. 
In our banking industry, again, it was something which was, um, uh, which was very positive from our point of view that most of the banks are employing more women than men. So there is a lot of competition going on because uh, a lot of these uh, uh, students, the girl students, are uh, getting uh, good professional degrees in order to join uh, the banking sector. Similarly, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, some of the educational f fields like engineering, et cetera, and uh, sciences, which were the exclusive domain of, uh, of uh, men, uh, again, we see uh, about 30 to 40 percent of women uh, getting admission in those uh, institutions. Uh, between US and Pakistan, as I mentioned, that we are the largest recipient of uh, Fulbright scholars, the scholarship. Every year, 200 uh, young uh, boys and girls, they uh, come to the United States of America to, to uh, undertake uh, uh, studies here. And, uh, and these, all these boys and girls who are selected, they're again from remote areas of Pakistan, including the tribal areas of Pakistan, and they are doing extremely well. We see uh, these young students who come here for education and then go back to contribute to the economic development of the country as a very important bridge between Pakistan and the United States of America. We are now working on the development of Pakistan-US knowledge corridor, and as par part of this knowledge corridor, we will be uh, we uh, we will establish linkages between the Pakistani universities with the universities in the United States of America. This would also involve exchange of students from both the countries and exchange of academics from both the countries. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think I have uh, certainly crossed my <laughs> the time limit that was given to me. I will stop here. And I'll be very happy to respond to any question that you may have. Thank you so much. So um, I'll start off with a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up to um, audience Q&A. Okay? Um, so thanks for a, a great, great speech. Um, since you ended on the topic of education, I thought we would start uh, with a question on education. So you mentioned um, successes uh, in and the focus on education uh, currently. Um, over the years, we've seen a lot of uh, improvements in uh, access to education and, and enrollment increases, certainly. And it's obviously a task that is still continuing. But if you could comment a little bit more on um, curricula reform and improvements in learning um, and quality of education, just because donors um, like the US, as well as um, other donors across the world, tend to focus a lot on these quantity of education indicators. But if we could um, sort of learn a little bit more about what efforts have been made to improve quality of education, especially vis-a-vis -vis sort of curricula, um, that would be a good place to start. Well, you see, the couple of uh, important uh, indicators. Mm -hmm. For instance, I'm sure that you have come from Pakistan. I'm, I suppose that you also came from the same education system that I came from, mm -hmm. or my children came from, or mm -hmm. many of the other Pakistani students who come from the same education system. And um, my interaction with the universities, mm -hmm. uh, my interaction with the students, and that uh, convinces me that many of the uh, uh, students who come to the United States of America and product of the, the early education system in Pakistan, they do extremely well. And I think they, are, uh, they, they compete with their other classmates. So that basically uh, is, is, is a reflection of the good quality education that, that uh, I was talking about. Certainly, there are areas which needs improvement because mm -hmm. In, uh, in our, uh, uh, during the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, in order to uh, defeat Soviet Union, uh, you know that a lot of these madrissas, they came up, uh, not only along the border, but also. So what the government is trying to do now is to introduce a reform of madrissas. The government has already formed the committee to look into the curriculum in order to bring it at par with the, uh, with the uh, 
the, the current day realities. Mm -hmm. so, so that, you know, the, uh, uh, if there were any distortions in the education system, they could be removed. Mm -hmm. As I said that um, more and more um, uh, uh, the girl students, you know, the enrollment has increased. The, um, uh, uh, more and more women are getting admission in the, in the uh, professional institutions. Mm -hmm. So one is um, uh, really hopeful that the future looks very, very bright for these young Pakistani boys and girls. And I have also uh, seen another very important trend, which is a recent trend, that most of these Pakistani students, uh, both boys and girls who come to the United States of America, or they go to other European countries, or go to Australia for higher education, they're all going back to Pakistan to, for, to contribute to the economic development, which is, again, a very positive trend that we are witnessing. Yeah. Um, if, I could, if I could sort of um, ask one more question on education, and then we can move sure. to bilateral relations and the regional security issue. Um, in terms of education, Pakistan has, you, you mentioned madrasas, and Pakistan also has, it has a public education system and, and, a, and a private education system and a very elite private education system. And, and some of the... The, the people we see who, who do really well in the, in the US are products of that sort of elite private education system. Are there efforts to, to bring that public education system to par with the, the, the sort of the more elite private education system or uh, to sort of improve the quality so that uh, people can sort of compete in a global environment from that public education system? Well, I, <laughs> again, I would say that it is a, uh, certainly uh, the effort is being made by the government in order to, um, to bridge the gap between private um, education, schooling education, and the public school. I am a product of the public school. You know, there is no doubt about it. And there are many uh, people like me who are also the products of public schools. And public schools, I remember, uh, provided very good quality education to, to, to young students who got uh, admitted in those schools. But over the years, I agree with you that the private schools, they have become sort of, uh, since they charge a heavy fee, so uh, the quality of sometimes education is not as good as is uh, provided in the private schools. But certainly an effort is being made by the government to, to address this issue. And they are addressing this issue by uh, improving the, uh, the, uh, the school buildings of public schools, by providing good facilities um, uh, in the school to uh, provide better uh, training to the teachers for teaching in, in public schools. And the idea basically is to develop the kind of infrastructure that would make the public schools um, equally attractive for a young student to get admission. Um, so moving to security issues, um, you mentioned some of the successes of Zarbia's the military campaign in uh, Waziristan. And certainly, I mean, in, we can see it with the numbers, terrorist attacks have gone down, fatalities have gone down, and we can also sort of get a sense of it when visiting Pakistan. I've been in Pakistan twice this year, and it's quite palpable, the fact that, that the internal security situation has improved. Um, sort of a two-part question relating to that. Uh, the first is how it has impacted bilateral relations with the U.S. And, and two, what is being done in terms of the longer-term national action plan, in terms of sort of um, uh, a counter-narrative to terrorist groups so that this problem, while it's been defeated militarily, doesn't arise again um, in the future? No, I think, the, um, again, a very important question because um, I remember that a couple of years ago when in every interaction that we had with the U.S., uh, the, uh, the situation in the tribal areas of Pakistan that used to be a major concern with the, with the U.S. interlocutors or the activities of, the, uh, of various uh, terrorist organizations. Well, I think the, uh, as uh, during my... Um, uh, Talk. I talked. I mentioned about the uh, development of this national consensus in the country against all these forces. So, in line with the national consensus, now we are taking action against all groups. And I think uh, with that, uh, it has certainly helped in developing a better, much better understanding 
between us and the United States of America. And here I would also like to mention that we, when we talk about the uh, op military operations in North Waziristan, uh, we certainly owe a debt of gratitude to the US uh, administration, members of the Congress, and also uh, uh, many other uh, institutions, including uh, the common people, for the kind of support that we receive from the United States of America. Uh, we got uh, uh, precision guided ammunition, we got uh, the, uh, uh, the helicopters, and we also got uh, the F-16s, which was certainly a game changer because we were talking about an area which was the most treacherous of the areas. Um, and um, without the kind of uh, uh, the sophisticated military equipment that we used in order to clean up the area, we couldn't have achieved our objectives. Um, thank you. So those are great, great answers. Um, we will now move to audience Q&A. If you could line up um, over there. We'll go first come, first serve. <laughs> and um, if you could keep your questions brief and to the point. Ambassador Jelani, Dr. Abzal, thank you for coming and speaking with us. Uh, my question um, is sort of more targeted towards education and specifically the technical and vocational training, um, and more specifically, efforts to integrate the tribal region into the local economy and education endeavors for students in those tribal regions. So. Well, you know, again, it is extremely important that as we have cleared the tribal areas of Pakistan from these uh, evil forces in the last one year, it is extremely important for us to build the infrastructure and also to provide quality education to the children of the tribal areas. Uh, many years ago, there was a very uh, uh, good suggestion uh, that, was, that came from members of the Congress to establish reconstruction opportunity zones in the tribal areas of Pakistan. But unfortunately, that um, um, proposal uh, did not uh, go, you know, move forward because of certain reasons. Uh, we feel that given the kind of challenges that we, f we, f we face and the kind of resource constraint that we have, it would require collective effort mm -hmm. on the part of uh, all of us who created that situation in the first place in the 70s. So accordingly, I think uh, uh, we are getting a lot of assistance from the United States of America. Mm -hmm. But the point is that in case you need, say, three or four billion dollars in order to build the kind of infrastructure that you're talking about. Uh, the, uh, the input that we are getting from the external sources is very small, and we have to basically prioritize our own uh, <laughs> expenses. So, but uh, but, uh, but uh, I think the, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is an area, there is a lot of uh, uh, understanding of this problem that we are faced with, and hopefully, as uh, uh, we uh, intensify our dialogue and uh, perhaps try and revive the proposal that, was, uh, that remained dormant for a number of years, I think that would bring a lot of uh, uh, prosperity to the people of the tribal areas. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Jelani, you touched upon the importance of economic development to peace in the region, and you talked about uh, how Pakistan is engaging with countries in the region and with the U.S., to uh, expand its uh, economic development. But could you touch on the domestic policies that Pakistan is pursuing to reduce graft corruption in Pakistan and to otherwise make Pakistan a better environment for new and growing businesses? Yeah, well, again, I think this is a very important issue because uh, corruption, good governance, as I mentioned, are, uh, uh, are the issues which are being constantly de being debated in the country, but here, Again, I would like to mention that, uh, uh, that democracy has done a lot of good to Pakistan. Uh, people of Pakistan, when they feel that a particular government uh, uh, is, has not uh, done very well in terms of uh, governance or uh, has not been able to arrest uh, the corruption, uh, people, they vote them out. And this is a phenomena, this is a constant phenomena that we are witnessing today. I think with the, uh, uh, the 
I mentioned about the ruthless nature of our media because the media is trying to pick holes uh, in almost everything from, you know, uh, whether the, you, uh, the members of the parliament, whether the bureaucracy, whether you name any institution and that comes under a lot of scrutiny as far as the media is concerned. Then there are civil society organizations which are continuously agitating this, uh, this uh, issue. So I would briefly mention that these uh, developments have also done a lot of good to us because uh, in Pakistan, the situation has improved significantly because um, in the last, for instance, two years, if you look at the reports which have uh, come, uh, which have been released by the international financial institutions or international rating agencies, the uh, rating, uh, Pakistan's economic outlook look has improved significantly uh, it, it is, again, because of the steps that the government has taken in order to ensure good governance, the steps taken by the government in order to, to arrest uh, corruption, uh, to go after corrupt elements. And I think, uh, and also because of the economic reforms, including the taxation reforms which have been introduced in the country. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I work on education development in East Africa and South Asia at the World Bank. So I'll throw a bit of numbers on you in terms of education development in Pakistan. Uh, so in the past five or six years, Pakistan has received more than $2 billion in education investments in public education. Uh, but as far as the results are concerned, we don't see those kind of numbers coming from the country. Particularly, Pakistan is still one of the five countries in the world with the most out-of-school aid children. So what is so different in the government strategy today that you think that these numbers will change when $2 billion couldn't make a difference? Yeah. No, but you see, the point is that the, you're talking about $2 billion for a, for a country uh, with a population of 200 million people. Uh, see, you're talking about a country where uh, the literacy rate was, uh, but was uh, about 60%. But today, I wish that I had the figures with me uh, to show that in the last uh, two years, uh, the enrollment, for instance, has increased uh, for uh, both boys and girls. Uh, as I mentioned, that we have introduced compulsory education. And also, we have provided incentives to the children in the rural areas where, uh, because of the economic reasons, the, chil the parents would not send their children to schools, but now, as part of this, uh, the uh, initiative that you're talking about, we are now providing children in the remote areas of Pakistan or the parents, we give them incentives and the cash incentives for, uh, in order, for, in order to, to, uh, to, uh, to basically uh, 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 lure them into schools. You know, that's, that is one thing. Then uh, the number of schools which are being established, the number of buildings which are being upgraded and the number of other universities which are being established, that require huge resources and $2 billion that you are talking about, that certainly uh, would not be sufficient. What we are talking about is we need to invest massive resources into this sector because this is a sector which I have absolutely, uh, I'll be frank and candid that I must confess that it, has, it, is, it is a sector which uh, needed uh, much more attention in the past, uh, but luckily that attention that it requires, that is being paid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much for speaking this evening and sharing some really interesting thoughts and insights. This question is for Mr. Ambassador. I'm just curious to know if you could share some of the outreach efforts you have undertaken in Washington and in the United States as the top Pakistani diplomat in America during your tenure. What have you done? What are you currently doing? And what would you like to achieve in the future? Yeah. You see, um, my job as a master of Pakistan is not only to uh, promote the interests of uh, my own country in this, uh, in this uh, great country, but also to, to also uh, build a strong relationship between our two countries. Uh, I can also, you know, I can only b build that strong, you know, relationship stronger by regular interaction with the uh, with the members of the administration. 
Uh, I am very fortunate. I am very lucky that I have got a very good uh, relationship with uh, almost every institution in, in, in the United States of America, whether it is the State Department, whether it is the Department of Defense, whether it's the uh, intelligence community, commerce or treasury or, uh, or USTR, uh, uh, education. So all these are relevant uh, areas. Uh, uh, economic uh, uh, cooperation, uh, trade development is an, another area of uh, my responsibility. And I have reason to feel satisfied that, uh, uh, that in the last uh, two years or so that I've been here, we have, we have uh, organized a number of conferences, both in the United States of America and in Pakistan, uh, attended by uh, very prominent businessmen from both the countries. Uh, Congress is another important area of uh, interaction for, for any diplomat here. Uh, I spend a lot of time on, on Congress. I spend at least uh, two or three uh, uh, days in a week uh, um, uh, interacting with members of the Congress and also with the senior staffers uh, because they also play a very, very important role. And I have reason to uh, be satisfied that uh, uh, we see that there is a lot of positivity that is emerging in, in, our con in the US Congress as far as Pakistan is concerned. Think tanks is another area of uh, interaction. I interact with think tanks on a regular basis. Uh, Pakistani-American community is certainly another important community that we have. It's a very uh, vibrant community uh, that we have. So again, you know, these are the kind of <laughs> media certainly is another area that I have to focus on. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, before we uh, go back and have something to eat and drink, and I hope you'll stay and join in the after discussant uh, conversation. It's my pleasure tonight to have the honor of presenting something. There we go. Every ambassador who speaks at our ambassador series, we honor with an ambassador's award. And it's my pleasure tonight to honor His, Alex His Excellency Jalil Abbas Jalani, Ambassador of the Republic of Pakistan to the United States, for his outstanding diplomatic leadership support of global education and international affairs. So I hope you'll join me in congratulating Ambassador Jalani. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.